Good morning. It's wonderful to see this growing group for those of us who started from GM1. So I'd like to sort of report back um, the fruits of GM1 through 3. Oh boy. Do I have to point it somewhere? There. Okay, so when the cancer group met, um, I think two GMs ago, uh, this is such a have talked about anything or decided to work on anything. So we chose a couple of things that had pretty good research evidence to implement. Um, one of them, or two of them, are relevant to universal lynch screening, one of them from colon cancer and one endometrial. And for those of you uh, who bring you up to speed, that at least in the Western world, colon cancer and endometrial are the component cancers of lynch syndrome, and I'll go into that a little bit. And chose a neuroendocrine tumor where the genetic load is high, and that's pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, and a very broad field of somatic genomics. And then we acknowledged that there were many crumbs left behind. After all, we cannot work on it. So a report back on universal lynch screening, and a little bit on the pheo and paraganglioma. Something different because we also talked about cross pollination amongst the various working groups. I'd like to share with you the Cleveland Clinic experience of a prototype cancer family history taking tool. So, without further ado, let me remind you about Lynch syndrome. It's the most common um, heritable colon cancer syndrome um, of the adult onset variety. And at least in the Western world, uh, colorectal cancer risk is as high as 40% lifetime in women, 85% in men, and in endometrial cancer, it's um, anywhere between a 25 and 40% lifetime risk. Importantly, there have been very nice population-based studies from many centers, especially in Finland and Ohio State, when I was there, that showed that between three and 5%, or they'll say 2.7% of all colorectal cancers are due to Lynch syndrome with germline mutations in the mismatch repair genes. Therefore, the cellular phenotype of Lynch colorectal cancers, endometrial cancers, are microsatellite instability because of these mismatch repair defects, and using simple immunohistochemistry show a lack of protein expression in the mismatch repair proteins. Making a diagnosis changes management, obviously, for the patient and then their family members. And just to remind everyone, if we did that, we would come a very long way in meeting one of the two agenda items of our Healthy People 2020. The other agenda item is trying to identify every inherited breast cancer syndrome. So what we did was an ASSIS assessment, which is between 2004 and 2007. So in theory, time, every single colorectal cancer, um, at least on our main campus, was put into the pathology workflow to look for MSI and IHC nullness for the mismatch proteins. If they're not there, if they're screen negative, we say they probably don't have HNPCC. We will not talk about the 5FU because this is where it illustrates where the data is good that you shouldn't be using 5FU but our clinicians find it very hard not to give adjuvant five of you. So we'll just set that aside. And if they screen positive, it goes in the pathology report, and I think most of us would say, job well done. Um, and then, of course, the surgeon should be reading the pathology report and then referring them to genetics. But is it a job well done? So and for approach one, which is our SS assessment, we had 237 cases. And the screen positive was 22%. So for those of you who are cancer genetics, you will recognize it. It's and when it's a tech high, it should be about a 10, 12%, not capturing enough. So of those, about half were referred for genetics, GC, genetic counseling. And 12 of those that were originally referred managed to make it for various reasons. Some of them forgot, some of them didn't think it was important, and so on. And 10 of the 38, or 26%, actually pursued Lynch genetic testing. And of those, 8% were positive. So then there was a brief approach to just a very short interval, so one year, where we said, 
Well, if the screen positive results were also shared with a genetic counselor who would remind the colorectal surgeon to call their patients, that might work. So in the middle column, so of course the denominator is less, it's only one year, the screen positives were still 20%. Um, and then the referral to the genetic counseling is higher, but if you look at the bottom line, the number of positive genetic tests is still sort of middling. It's not great. So finally, in our third approach, which we have been using since 2008 onwards, and I think truly every single colorectal cancer specimen that's been resected at our main campus does undergo this. Uh, we're trying to reel in the regional practice. Um, and so what's the difference? We added BRAF testing and MLH1 methylation. Um, we also, so with the agreement of the patients, they're given a brochure that says this will happen. The results of all the MSI IRC testing are passed through our genetic counselors who would review it. And they have been blessed to contact the patient directly and then referred for counseling. So in that third approach, as you can see, you'll see that the, the screen positives have dropped to 14%, so that's pretty good. 100% were referred for genetics. And if you look at the bottom line, we were able to find 17 out of the 56 who pursued genetic testing to, be, to have Lynch syndrome. So we're a little bit pleased with this. So then the naive side, my partner Kate Nathanson and Penn um, was going to implement this, and I think she's told me that uh, she has challenges, and we'll just leave it at that. Do you want to say something? So actually, um, it's, I think it's been really interesting because I think one of the problems is the issues of reimbursement and the issues of what you can do without having an order have really changed over time. And since Penn has coming late to the screen, so for example, one accepts that every breast cancer gets ER and PR um, screening. But what's happened is that now, uh, because of uh, compliance issues, in fact, that wouldn't go forward today because there would have to be an order for physicians for things to be done, interestingly enough. And so we're actually having to do a whole thing where we're writing a, basically a universal order for this to be done and working with the compliance officers to be able to do this and having a whole process on that this can be done on inpatients that we as part of the DRG that we don't have to wait until people get out of the DRG so that it doesn't, it can be costed against the inpatient costs. It's actually been a very long, complicated process, but we've just submitted a letter um, that we've all agreed on to try to get it uh, adapted. It's been a very difficult process. Yeah, and I, th I think just to, before we move on to the uh, uh, perigonglioma, uh, certainly uh, the uh, experience that we had at Intermountain um, uh, emphasize the idea that it, it, unless you take a systematic approach to this and develop a, a care process, uh, you will really have less than optimal results. And for those of you who are, um, including Kate, uh, who are in the process of implementing it, we have two publications that um, uh, have come out related to this. One is uh, the business case uh, and decision modeling uh, that we use to uh, look at uh, these issues, specifically the issues relating to uh, payer mix and uh, the implications for uh, the hospital related to the uh, additional cost under a DRG or a, a fee-for-service arrangement. That modeling is uh, something that most of your business folks should be familiar with and might help to um, shortcut the process. Mm -hmm. The other question that comes up on the clinical side um, frequently is the impact of whether or not we should be imposing an age cutoff. So rather than screening everybody, should we only be screening people under the age of 50 with colorectal cancer or 60 under the And so um, in the Journal of Oncology Practice, um, there should be an article appearing shortly that uh, uh, where, again, we applied our decision model uh, and looked at uh, the, uh, hum, uh, the impact on sensitivity and specificity that would be uh, realized if you imposed an age cutoff b uh, based on the data that we have and, and the use of uh, the Ohio State data. Right, and so in real time for our endometrial cancers, our GYN ONGs, in fact, wanted to impose a 50-year-old age cutoff and so empirically, we're probably proving what you're showing with the models, that we actually miss quite a few of um, germline mutation positives. So there you go. But I, 
think it is important, and I think one of the things that the cancer work group can really do is, again, aggregating these types of data because, you know, the modeling is good, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the joke is what's the difference between a statistician and an economist? Uh, statisticians actually need data. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the models are only as good as the data that underlies the assumptions, and so the more data that we can pull together that actually looks at the outcomes of systematic um, screening approaches, we can refine those models so that they really are much more reflective of real world. And that's a very nice tangible next steps for the lynch part for our working group. So we welcome more people who fancy that sort of work. So off to pheochromocytomas. So pheochromocytomas and the related paragangliomas are neuroendocrine tumors, and these are things that derive from the neural crest. They can be malignant or not. Usually they're not. Um, even if they're not malignant, they can be in very inconvenient sites. They're also inconvenient when they're hormonally active, so they secrete adrenaline, noradrenaline, and various other things. And this can result in sudden death at worst, in hypertension, stroke, etc. Interestingly, unlike most other cancers where the genetic component is 5 to 15 percent, in pheos and perigangliomas, 30 to 40 percent of all comers, irrespective of whatever, have a germline mutation in one of 10 genes that we know of. There are gene-specific risks of various cancers, of malignancies, of other cancers, and gene-specific management, therefore. There's a genotype clinical outcome association, so we felt that was rather important, and it's actionable. And of course, like everything else that we've spoken about, there are no practice guidelines. So out of GM2 and 3 came, we gathered ourselves, and we talked and we talked, and we gathered four health systems um, that seem to be from Wisconsin eastwards. Um, they reflect a bit of diversity, but of course they're all anchored by a central university-based um, main campus and regional practice. But you've also seen that we've gathered the PIs who have very, very different backgrounds, but the necessary multidisciplines. What we wanted to do is to develop a very systematic approach for ascertaining every single field chromocytoma and paragangioma patients, almost like the colorectal cancer model and Lynch syndrome. And, but we said, I think in the modern era, can the EMR help us? And so we were going to look into that and evaluate. Paragangliomas are in the ganglia, but they're considered extra adrenal. There are several definitions, of course. Um, Paragangliomas are very easy because they are limited by a few diagnostic codes and it just pulls it out. Things in the adrenal are a little hard, but uh, exploring whether the physician or physician assistant can help that once that thing alerts them, whether is it just an adrenal incidentaloma, which is going to be most of the cases, versus in the adrenal medulla itself. Then we wanted to see what was the most impactful way of testing a patient. The, our European American field chromocytoma um, study group um, actually has a population base, and we now have a, a, about mm, a thousand uh, population based registrants it's based in Germany and central Poland. And with that, we were able to actually come up with an algorithm um, based on data of if you see certain features, how should we prioritize testing? So, of course, at the Cleveland Clinic, being one of the consortium sites, we do follow that. We also acknowledge that other sites like PennNet and so on might actually do either full bundled testing, ra rarely all 10 genes, but bundled testing. Now, for our approach, if we go step by step, um, there are downsides, as you can imagine. It takes time. And after a while, those patients get what we call testing fatigue. Worst of all, even though I said that 30 to 40 percent of these patients have a germline mutation, half of the ones that don't have it still have the clinical red flags that say it has to be genetic. So too young, multifocal disease, you know, family history, where it's not in one of these 10 genes. So we were going to compare the efficacy to um, exome sequencing. I almost said whole, but I took it out. Finally, we were going to look at the psychosocial impacts. So in other words, would the patient say, wahoo, I like it just, you know, drawn in one fell soup. I don't have to keep coming back. You keep telling me it's negative, it's negative. Let's go to the next gene. 
Finally, and I think this is probably the most ambitious, but it also touches great practicality. So here we say, all right, it's well and good that you can say, ma'am, you have a mutation in X, you are this, you must do this. We can track compliance with the screening recommendations, and we can record the incident new neoplasias or size growth and so on. So this is a surrogate for are we catching things in time? And this is very acceptable in clinical cancer genetics. And in fact, in an even rarer syndrome, leaf romney syndrome, this has been done and published. Finally, because there are no cost-effective modeling in fear and perigangliomer testing and management, we were going to do that with Mike Katan, who is expert in this. And from all the data that we gathered to slowly implement the evidence to inform guidelines, and Kate is in charge of those guidelines. And we submitted this to uh, the pilot demonstration projects, and yes, we know it's a cow. We should also say, so a little nod to the somatic genomics, but also the interaction of work groups and other NHGRI um, initiatives. Kate is co-chair of the TCGA for Feel and Paragangliomas, which did not come up yet at the last meeting, but she's there, and we've gathered a um, multinational group to participate. So now this is a little bit of can the various groups interact with other groups, and there's a family history group here as well. So this is a, pro this is a report back on three experience of a prototype tool, which our institution forced us to do, but without giving us resources. So anyway, so Scotch duct tape, cancer family history taking tool. So we implemented it, piloted it in Cleveland Clinic Oncology focused clinical settings. The scheduling of the qualifying appointment is by appointment type. So when a patient gets a specific code, it triggers the patient via email to complete My Family Health History at a secure portal. And we viewed this as a quality improvement initiative um, because we know how terribly good our clinicians are at taking family histories. We also use EPIC and not the fancy EPIC that Penn has. Um, it's terrible. And so it doesn't get done. So we analyze this for uptake. So in other words, do, will we capture the population or people will just say, oh, it's too much trouble. So we looked at um, uptake, personal diagnosis of neoplasm, sex, age, and socioeconomic class. So you can imagine the hypothesis, perhaps people who have already had cancer might be more motivated. Um, people under 65, we like to play with our computers perhaps uptake would be higher there too. And of course, a very famous one, of course, with higher socioeconomic status, the uptake is better. So we collected, we have 877 or 76% of the cohort had a prevalent history of neoplasia already. Most were female, which is interesting. 87% um, were under 65. Um, and the socioeconomic status was estimated by median family income by zip code. To our pleasant surprise, there was no difference in completion rate of my family health history by diagnosis, prevalent diagnosis of neoplasm, by sex, or by SES, which is very good news. We weren't surprised, of course, that there was a decreased odds of completing for folks over 65. So this is all univariate analysis. So when we put it in the multivariate model, um, age still came out in the wash. So then we thought, well, this is rather important. Lots of people over 65. And lots of people over 65 are, are considered the family, um, fam the keeper of the family history. So we thought we would go into a focus group and survey for barriers. And then there was a suggestion that it might not be age, because of course it's not 100% uptake for all the other groups. But are there shared domains or shared people who are not completing? So we'll have to do that. I'm a little daunted because it's a lot of work. I mean, I have a wonderful large team, but it's still a lot of work. So with the prototype, speaking about institutions and what they want or need to actually release resources. So after this prototype, the Cleveland Clinic released resources uh, for us to build a scalable family history uh, tool. And so again, it had to be web-based, patient entered, 
And of course, we need a clinical decision support at the point of care, so a theme that we have heard yesterday and before. And yes, it will be EMR compatible. We build in HL7 language. And we built a platform with modules for automatic risk assessment. In our prototype, um, we were the automatic risk assessment. So that's not very convenient if you're going to deploy it in large health systems. So the first few modules were made. We tried to um, take the most common heritable diseases. Um, we also uh, did focus groups of our end users, the non genex clinicians, whether they thought this would be good ones to begin with. So after Labor Day, in a rolling model, we have started beta testing my family in different settings. And the most important settings are all uh, primary care providers out in the regional practice. Um, so far, so good with a few hiccups. We're going to take feedback after we formally analyze it and continue to tweak our tool and to build modules that doesn't end. Um, and the reason why we build it in modules is, as already alluded here, guidelines will change because the evidence will change. It will be easy to revise the whole module versus taking down the entire platform and revising it. Um, and we also heard the theme that not every hospital or healthcare system or place uh, our clinic or private practice is going to be like the Cleveland Clinic. And so we have approach or places that are not like us have approached us for beta testing. Um, oh, yes, you might be interested to hear. You're probably thinking now, how did they make those algorithms? So we used the IOM guidelines to make the algorithms. We started with the existing professional society guidelines. We gathered a group, uh, several groups, per module that had representation from genetic counseling, from the content expertise of the non-genetics clinician and the geneticist. And behind the content experts of the vascular surgeon, for example, he or she will also have their support behind them. So the stakeholders, the people who are actually going to use this. And so that's, uh, that's a process that was really quite good. And it also generated a lot of support, as you can imagine. So thank you. And I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Harris. Uh, comment and a question. Um, going back to the uh, colorectal cancer, I, I just wanted to uh, reflect for the group as a whole. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about um, uh, the idea that how to get things represented in some of the important guiding uh, uh, documents uh, like USPSTF or other things of that nature. I think one of the things about the Lynch syndrome uh, project that's really critically important is that that is, in fact, uh, represented, at least hereditary colorectal cancer, is represented as a goal in Healthy People 2020. Uh, so we can link it to that. And also that has been uh, one of three genetic use cases that has been flagged by the uh, CDC's Office of Public Health Genomics as being achievable um, as a public health um, uh, genomic goal. So I think that uh, this uh, effort uh, has a lot of opportunity for visibility in relation to those things, and that may be the one of the first uh, uh, within the scope of what we've been talking about to uh, to do that. So, uh, uh, again, more reasons to be involved and engaged in that. The question I had, uh, Karis, is you did reference in the last part of your talk the family history work group of the genomic medicine uh, group, and so I was just curious. I didn't see in the presentation uh, the specific if any, consultations that you'd had or, or the cross-representation between uh, the family history group that Jeff leads and your group. And so if you could just expand it's on just, that. It's just been informal. So up until we finished the prototype, I mean, frankly, I and Cleveland Clinic felt too embarrassed to be part of your group. So it's <laughs> true. Um, and with this, though, um, we'd like to ask whether we can uh, formally join your group and I'll send someone else in, since obviously I, I cannot be in every single work group. Embarrassment is a well, good I thing. No need to be embarrassed for sure, but I think this is great, and I, uh, the idea that the working group, as it uh, takes on its next iteration of its life to include other initiatives like the one that you're doing, one that Marin is doing, and others uh, to really um, be a cohesive force around family history for all the reasons you articulated um, would be uh, a terrific thing for us to be doing. Thank you. 
Uh, Brad? So to Mark's comment, uh, how do you engage the families in the Lynch Syndrome uh, project? And, and what's the uptake by the families? Yeah, so the patients themselves are given a brochure and before surgery and the they're encouraged to share it with the family members. So it's the family member part that we don't know about and of course like all nice tertiary referral hospitals, a lot of the family members are not in Cleveland. So that would be a lovely next, next step into our cancer working group, especially for the Lynch group. It, it's always the family. Yeah, it is a challenge, uh, uh, and essentially what you end up uh, doing is whoever has the initial contact uh, with the uh, person who's identified as part of the screening program, you're reliant on their ability to kind of capture that data on uh, whether or not family members have been contacted, whether they're seeking help, and so that is, it's very manual, meaning it's very resource intensive. There's no really automated way to do that. Uh, very easy, easily, but it, clearly very important because, as we know from the EGAP working group report uh, and some of the subsequent cost effectiveness analyses that have been done using um, uh, that data, uh, the true cost effectiveness of the Lynch syndrome screening relates to the identification of unaffected relatives and instituting uh, preventive services uh, or early uh, identification services to avoid or at least identify cancer at an early stage. So it is something that we need to, you know, uh, to, to work on. You can Joan. imagine that if we can somehow link it in fact to the family history group stuff, maybe having them fill in the family history or help the proband fill in the family history would be engaging enough and draw them in. Um, so as we are uh, beta testing these people, we actually go out to do um, tape interviews with the patients um, with the care providers just to make sure that A, the patients are not disrupted and B, the care, the flow, the clinical workflow is not disrupted because it's like, oh, heaven forbid. And, and all the, the patients have said, how did you pick me for this? One of the points that they were randomly pick. I'm so on it. It's so fun. You know, I call my family members and the family uh, members are very engaged. And I think there's also an opportunity. I know that some people have talked about it, uh, but there hasn't been a lot of work, but uh, one of the ideas is to use um, social media approaches uh, to family mm -hmm. history that could you create uh, a, a patient family history where there could also allow connections with other family members to contribute additional family history data. It's something uh, that's been discussed conceptually, but uh, again, because of some concerns about, uh, again, privacy and, and other things, uh, the idea of doing it uh, within a healthcare system versus outside a healthcare system is um, uh, it is a bit of a challenge, but it, but I think it's a it's an interesting way to think about you know taking a uh, uh, you know a genealogy you know type approach, um, but have it with uh, medical family history. Uh, so Joan. Yeah, I wonder if there's an opportunity for synergistic of efforts around developing the, uh, some of the clinical decision support tools that are being done. Um, you know, we've gone through an extensive evaluation just in, before even developing the clinical decision support for the prenatal family history tool of what should we be screening for and what are the practice guidelines and what are the recommendations. And we're currently doing, as you know, the same thing with the pedi for a pediatric uh, family history tool. And even that decision about what do you, what do you, in, what questions, what's, what are you screening for is in of itself a huge effort. And then you have the development of the actual mm -hmm. um, clinical decision support and what are the messaging, uh, et cetera. So there, and there's, and there I know there are other groups who are involved in the same uh, in the same efforts. So it seems to me there's an opportunity to share some of that um, uh, of that information and, and experience, so that we aren't all reinventing the wheel. And yeah, not only do we share that, I have to point out that Emily Edelman, who was our first genetic counselor project manager, went to work for Niche Pack. We even share people. It's wonderful. And and. Why are institutions actually not touching um, the prenatal and the pediatric? Because why reinvent the wheel? Yeah, and I think and you, we'll just, if you think about this again in the more, more modular perspective, you can the underlying family structure issues are universal. I mean, those are cr cross-cutting across all family history tools. You have to be able to represent the proband, the parents, the siblings, et cetera, et cetera. So that type of structure uh, can be done, and once it's done, 
then what you overlay in terms of the information can vary depending on the specific use case. So I think a lot of it relates to the, um, you know, what specific things are you trying to collect and when. So it's not only the guidelines that are out there, but also when do you clinically, when do, when do you present a module to a patient in the course of their clinical care, which is another interesting question. So again, I think there are a lot of mm -hmm. these types of questions that um, uh, can be addressed, and it, it, it's, I think it's really exciting to think about uh, the idea that a family history is something, a document that gets richer and richer and richer as people progress through their lifespan, but also through their clinical encounters. Jeff. I think one of, one of the points that Joan was making is that maybe there's an opportunity here to create a common toolbox for um, various uh, uh, platforms that family history is using. In other words, guidelines are obviously uh, the standard, and uh, as, as Karis pointed out, it takes a lot of effort to bring the guidelines into a clinical decision support engine. Uh, and through OpenCDS, uh, I think we could um, think, think through uh, how to make um, these guideline-driven uh, engines uh, available to a number of different types of platforms that may be used in different health arenas for capturing family history and delivering uh, guideline-informed decision-making. I think that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jim. Katie. So I wanted to just mention that in the, in the spirit of this being a meeting that is focused on education, I wanted to point out that um, the AMA and NichePEG um, collaborated um, recently on an a educational uh, resource for physicians and other health care providers on uh, hereditary colorectal cancer um, syndromes. And it um, goes over... Um, uh, risk assessment, um, uh, identifying red flags, collaboration and referral to other providers, and it's based on guidelines that are well established, the EGAP guidelines, uh, NCCN guidelines, uh, uh, guidelines from the gastroenter gastroenterologists. And one um, unique feature that we, we really put a lot of work into was um, in addition to being able to take this as a traditional uh, online CME, there is also a performance improvement um, version of this. So a physician or other healthcare provider can actually assess his or her uh, um, skill in uh, recognizing red flags and, and referring and ordering um, genetic testing when appropriate, both before and after taking the, the course. And so we're hopeful we're going to be um, uh, uh, analyzing some of the data from the groups that have taken both the online traditional format and then the format that involves a performance improvement arm. Um, we're going to be hopefully comparing those and finding out whether that performance improvement activity that is included um, actually really does produce sustained um, improvement in the way that physicians and other healthcare providers recognize um, these families and go about uh, caring for them and, and referring to, to specialists. And that can be found on um, the AMA's website or NichePEG's website, and it's freely open to any physician or healthcare provider. Great, thank you. Uh, Erwin, last question. Uh, Karis, this, this is a very significant uh, effort that you've undertaken, in particular in the context of working with EPIC. Uh, which is certainly covering a lot of the EHR market across the nation. And um, I want to congratulate you on that. And for your beta-tested version, um, and you mentioned this, oh, my God, the clinical workflow. I mean, that's obviously the holy <laughs> grail in our operations. Um, so where does the information from my family then actually reach uh, the physician, and at what point? Is it on opening the chart? I mean, or how... For those that have enrolled in my family, give us the flavor of how it then looks in the doctor's office. Yeah, so this is very interesting. So the two parts, one of it is alluded. So in other words, if there's a family history that has been flagged as high hereditary risk, um, is the physician liable? So we were concerned about that, the clinicians were. So we got legal involved, and the solution was because if the patient doesn't show, do you still have that legal responsibility? And, and the answer is no if you don't open it. So the, this, my family is actually locked until the, the, the patient comes in and registers, and then it opens up. And so it's so the famous left hand column ethic, it, you, can, you actually click family history. And, and it opens up. So, you know, we geneticists like pedigree. So, of course, there's a pedigree drawing part. Most primary care physicians 
forget and they don't like pedigrees. So it actually shows up immediately as a sort of a descriptor and then uh, the decision support is ranked in order of red to green, so the most heritable stuff all the way to general population risk. It also has a little button right now that says, although we were told the color was wrong, so that's the first feedback, they couldn't find it, we'll change it. It will say accept and refer, so the button refers to genetics, or if they say, mm, something looks funny, it just doesn't seem right, the risk looks too high, too low, um, they can hit review, so our staff will review it, and they can, they can review it and ask for a referral or review it and hold, and then we'll get back to them, so that, that's how part of the feedback is taken. Very good, thank you. Um, we are running ahead of schedule. Uh, which is a good thing. Uh, we will be more ahead of schedule because as best as we can uh, tell, uh, Andrew Futro um, is, is not uh, in the building. So if you've been hiding or underneath <laughs> the table or something, we'll let you talk. But otherwise, uh, one of the things that we've um, encouraged uh, over the different genomic medicine meetings is that when we have new groups, new participants that are joining, uh, we would like to hear uh, a um, uh, brief summary of the activities that are going on in the implementation space. And so I'm pleased to uh, um, uh, have uh, John Harley uh, present on behalf of uh, Cincinnati uh, Children's Hospital 